Oh, like this. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Marco Luxia, uh, and I forgot to plug in the clicker. <laughs> Let's see if it works. Is it on? It's on. Oh, it works. Uh, so about me. So I've been a Java developer for 15 years, but otherwise I've been uh, developing software for 20 plus years. Uh, the last six years I was uh, I've been at Red Hat. Started with implementing uh, Weld and CDI, um, but then also worked on Cape Dwarf, which is a uh, Google App Engine API uh, implemented on top of JBoss products. Um, I contributed to InfiniSpan, Hibernate Search, Wildfly, lot, lots of stuff. Uh, the last three years I'm working in cloud enablement, which is a team in Red Hat that um, basically make sure that all our middleware products work on OpenShift or on Kubernetes and so on. Um, I've been working with Kubernetes since version 0 0.4, so that's a long, long time ago, uh, and I'm currently working in the Service Catalog Federation team, so basically we make multiple Kubernetes uh, clusters work together as one giant supercluster and working on the Service Catalog also. Uh, I'm also the author of this book, uh, which you can get for free today. So I have 20 copies I can give away. Oops, <laughs> that's the minus one, yeah. So uh, I'll be signing books at the reception area in the next long break. So if anyone is interested, just come. I'll give you the free book, and that's it. But I have around 20 to give out. Um, OK. So enough about me. So about you, obviously a lot of you, a lot of you uh, have used Docker, right? So how many? Okay, good. Uh, how many of you are ops people, and how many of you are developers? So ops first, <laughs> yeah. Or it's both, right? Yeah, it's the same in Slovenia. So smaller companies, you need to do everything, right? Uh, Docker you're using. Uh, Kubernetes, how many of you are using Kubernetes? Good, you came to the right talk. Uh, and how many of you are using Kubernetes in production? One? Just one, okay. Uh, so let's do a quick introduction of Kubernetes. Uh, so what, what is it? Um, so it's an open source system, so I'm not here to sell you anything. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's evolved from Google systems that they have been using for the past 15 years. So basically all their stuff runs on on Borg and Omega, which are two predecessors of Kubernetes. So basically, they took all the good things from both of the systems and made a new project called Kubernetes, and now it's open source. So basically, Kubernetes basically is used to run all of Google's apps, so to manage their infrastructure, sort of. Uh, what Kubernetes does is, um, it hides the actual hardware from the developers or the ops people doing the deployment of the apps, right? So uh, instead of caring about individual servers, for instance, you don't need to SSH into a server to install uh, an application and then configure it all. Uh, all you do is tell Kubernetes, I want to run this app. You describe an app somehow, and then Kubernetes runs it, right? Um, and it doesn't matter if, it's, uh, if Kubernetes is only made up of one machine in the cluster or if the cluster is made up of 1,000 machines, right? It, it, you use it in exactly the same way. Um, and the thing that it allows you to, to do is deploy the apps in a self-service fashion. So you no lo a developer no longer needs the ops team to deploy their apps, right? Instead, the, developer, the developers themselves can deploy their apps on their own, right? And then once the app is running, Kubernetes takes care that the app, if it crashes, is restarted automatically, uh, or if the whole machine crashes, the apps that were running on that machine are moved to the remaining machines, right? Um, so why should you use Kubernetes at all, right? Because maybe the system you have right now is working, maybe it's not. Uh, 
as I said, you, you always deploy your applications in the same way, right? It doesn't matter if it's a local cluster, a big cluster, whatever, or if you're deploying on cloud uh, infrastructure, right? So for instance, let's say you, you're using Google at the moment, so Google, uh, Google Cloud, um, and then decide to move to AWS, you're gonna be able to use, to, to deploy your applications in exactly the same way, right? Apart from the lower level stuff, which you, obviously you still, still need the sort of sysadmin types of people that take care of Kubernetes or underlying stuff, but otherwise for the developer it's the same thing, right? Uh, and Kubernetes handles most things automatically without you having to do anything, either you or the ops team or the sysadmins, right? And one of the best things is that it, so when you use Kubernetes, you end up needing less hardware, so less uh, machines, right? Uh, and why is that? Because Kubernetes is the one that selects where to put each, uh, each of your applications, and by doing that, it can do it can make great decisions on how to do that better uh, than you can do manually, right? So it basically packs your applications into a small number of machines. So they're really densely packed. Um, yeah, I think I had that slide already, but okay. <laughs> uh, so Google is being embraced, uh, uh, Kubernetes is being embraced by, by lots of companies, so basically that's why you're, you're here, because you have heard how uh, a great, uh, how great of a project it is. Because um, I had this sort of talk last year and there was not, enough, not, not that amount of people there, so that number of people. Um, obviously Red Hat, the company I work for, uh, is really into Kubernetes. You may have heard that we have uh, bought a company just recently, uh, which is also big in the Kubernetes world. Uh, so, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're all in. Uh, and Kubernetes has become the de facto standard for cloud computing, because uh, all the major cloud providers have embraced it, and you can now get a managed instance of Kubernetes uh, anywhere you want. Uh, and I forgot to run my stopwatch, so how much time? <laughs> 15, okay. okay. Just so that I know where, where I am. So uh, yeah, I don't know if any, everyone can see this. So this is a Kubernetes cluster deployed on four Raspberry Pis. Um, I use it to demo Kubernetes and also to, uh, to play around with it because it allows you to see some things that you cannot see uh, through the command line tools, right? Uh, so each of these LEDs is one running application. The blue ones are the system applications and there are no green ones because there are no uh, user applications running. Um, yeah, I'm gonna use it in my demo. So uh, the, the color of the LED either says, uh, signals what kind of application it is uh, and uh, also the state of the application. So if, if it's yellow, it's not ready. If it's green, it's ready and so on. And when the white flash occurs, that means that an incoming request has come into that specific instance of the application. You're gonna see that later. Uh, so how do we use Kubernetes? Um, basically, I, as a developer, write an application descriptor. Uh, in, so that's a YAML file, which includes descriptions of all the components that make up my system, right? I send this descriptor to the Kubernetes master, and then Kubernetes um, deploys it on all of the machines, on those, it selects machines in my cluster for each individual application, it selects one machine and then runs it. Plus I can specify that I want five copies of a certain application and I'm gonna get five copies, right? So as far as I'm concerned, I'm only talking to the master and the, I don't care how many machines are behind the master, right? So in, in my case, the master is the top machine, the three bottom ones are the worker uh, machines. Uh, so an app descriptor looks something like this. Um, as you can see, it's, it's a file, so you can store it in your VCS system, right? 
Uh, and every time you make a change to the file, you can push it to Kubernetes and it's gonna update the state of your system, right? Uh, each file is made up of three or four sections. So first is the, the type of object we're defining, the name and other metadata of the object, and then we have the specification which defines the desired state of the object, and once we send this file to Kubernetes, we can then get it back again, right? And we'll get the actual current status of the application here, or of the object, right? So a pod is basically a running application. So it's one, one instance of a running application, which is basically usually one Docker container, or maybe two or three containers, which basically need to run together in order to, to be one complete unit. Um, so Kubernetes has a, a command line tool called kube control, kube ctl, or kube cuddle. Those are the three ways of naming it. Um, and basically, you can interact with it like this, or the, you can interact it with it through the REST API uh, sys, uh, uh, endpoint, which the master server exposes. Um, yeah, and the, the main thing about how Kubernetes is used is you do not tell it what to do. Instead, you just describe the state, the, des the desired state of the system. So. Uh, let's say you don't say, please run four additional copies of my application. Instead, you say, at this point in time, I want 10 copies to be running. And then Kubernetes will see that two copies are, are already running, right? And it's, it, it's going to figure out that it needs to run eight additional copies, right? Uh, so it might seem insignificant, but that's really, really important because uh, it makes things a lot easier. Um, if you want to get started with Kubernetes, you can try uh, Minikube, which is a single node Kubernetes cluster, runs in a virtual machine. Uh, or you can now even run, install Docker and you get uh, Kubernetes with it. On macOS, I know it's already been two months or so, and I think on Windows it just came out or is going to come out right now. Or you can try any of the cloud offerings. Uh, of course, you can also try Red Hat solution, which is OpenShift, which is something more than Kubernetes, but this is not the topic of this. Okay, so let's try a quick demo. Um, ba -ba -bum. So I have an app. Let me just check. Yeah. No, I'm going to skip the demo for now, so because I'm running a bit late. But we'll, we'll, we'll show this as part of the next demo. Um, so, how does how does deploying apps in Kubernetes look like, right? So, uh, uh, deploying Java apps, right? So, you build your jars as usual. You create a do then you need to create a Docker image because Kubernetes runs Docker images or any other type of uh, container images. Uh, but let's say you, you guys are most familiar with Docker, so let's talk about Docker. Um, so you create an image. I'm sure you know how to do that because you use Docker. And then you also need to write the resource manifest. So those are the YAML files I showed previously. Um, or you can use the Fabricate Maven plugin. Uh, so to get started, for you who are Java developers, it's probably best, since you guys probably know Maven, right? And know how to use it. Uh, you can use Maven instead of running your own uh, resource manifest and creating them and deploying them, because, but yeah. So, um, maybe just a quick solution before I go to the Maven plugin, uh, let's, Let's deploy a quick app. Oh, so I use the K A alias for kube control, right? So I can do like go like this. K get pod. This is kube ctl get pods. I have no resources, so no applications at the moment. 
but I can deploy my own application like this. So I have my resource manifest here. Hope you guys can see it in the back. Or I can show it here. So this is my manifest. Uh, it's sort of like the one I showed you previously, but this, this, this describes a deployment instead of a pod, which is something above a pod now. That does not matter at this point. Um, and the app is a simple web app with three methods, which just returns uh, a simple message every time you hit it, right? So if I want to deploy this app to Kubernetes, uh, obviously I had to build jars, I had to build a Docker image, uh, push it somewhere, I've already done that, but now let's just deploy it to Kubernetes. The way I do that, do that is by using this command. Oh, I'll so that's it, a single command that deploys uh, the app to Kubernetes, and as you can see, it's running on node number two. So this is master node one, node two, node three, right? Can everyone, everyone see, yeah? So it's already green, it's working, and now I can try to hit that app with curl, uh, but first I need to figure out where it's located. Uh, so, yeah, I'm not gonna explain this because it's, it's, it's a detail, but let's say I can now hit this app by through a port, and I can hit the app on any port, any machine in the cluster, so either node one, node two, node three. That's a specific thing, it's not worth mentioning right now. As you can see, it should be blinking, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so uh, the app is obviously running, and I can list my apps, and I can see that I have one app currently running in my system, right? Um, so, The next thing that Kubernetes does is it allows me to uh, to instance instantly copy the application and run ten instances of this application. Right? All I said was I want ten instances to be running instead of one, and it spun up nine additional instances. They are all green, and if I now start hitting my application in a while loop. Ah, damn. It starts, it, it, it's obviously slow at first because the Java app needs to warm up, right? So it needs to load the classes, but once it goes, it, it's off the hook, right? <laughs> so, um, and now what happens, so, one great thing about Kubernetes, what happens if one of the machines dies, right? Let's say I'm gonna, ooh, what happened? Ooh, yeah, we lost connectivity <laughs> for some reason. I shouldn't be touching it, I guess. Oh, it's working, yeah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, I won't touch it anymore, but I'm gonna disconnect node four. Let's disconnect it, and you'll see that two or three new apps are gonna appear as soon as the master decides that they are no longer available. It takes about 10 seconds. Hopefully it's gonna be faster. Uh, because I lifted it and this is an old router and I guess the connection is bad, so <laughs> the, the network connection went down. Oh, damn. It's hard to do if you can't see the, what's, what's going on. Um, so basically Kubernetes should now run my app on the other applications. I don't know if that happened. Let's see. No, it hasn't uh, detected that yet. Maybe I haven't set the timers already uh, properly. Never mind. Okay, so what you're here for. Let, let's switch to Fabricate Maven plugin. So instead of building, building Docker containers from scratch and uh, having to see how Docker files work and things like that, you can use the Fabricate Maven plugin which allows you to do lots of stuff, right? First, it will create 
the Docker image for you and push it to a Docker registry. Uh, when you do a Maven clean install, for instance, right? And then it's also going to create the necessary resource manifests for Kubernetes. And this is the fabricate resource command. And you can all even run your applications on Kubernetes as though they are running on uh, your own machine. So let's show that quickly. Let's say I need to delete my previous app. Uh, could be a fabricate. And clean install is going to build it. Build success. Here somewhere should be building Docker image. So it built the Docker image, and now I can run uh, Maven fabricate run. And it should run the app. And you'll see that the, the output of the application is going to be visible in my console where I ran the Maven, uh, Maven command, right? So, this, so as you can see, this is the output of the command. And if I now hit it with curl, it's going to start blinking and so on. So really simple. And now I can show you how, what I needed to do in order to get to this point. So instead of writing a Docker file, writing a, uh, a resource uh, manifest. All I did was add this to my Maven POM file. So I added the plugin and specified oh a bunch of metadata for uh, how to build the image, right? I, I told Maven plugin the name of the image, uh, what port, uh, the application exposes its uh, HTTP server on, what's the main class, and that's it, right? Uh, besides this, I also had to specify an assembly descriptor to specify which libraries should be included in my uh, Docker image. And that's it. So as you can see, there's no Docker file I do have a make file, but that's just for me, so I can run it quickly. Um, yeah. So basically, if you know how to work with Maven, you'll be able to deploy, to, all, to build Docker images and deploy on Kubernetes, right? So really simple. Um, it even allows you to debug your application, so you run Maven fabricate debug, it sets the necessary environment variables, so then if your application uh, detects those variables, it can enable debug mode, and you can debug the application from uh, your IDE. Yeah. I need to skip. So, a few things you need to be careful of when deploying in Kubernetes. Um, usually, apps that run on Kubernetes are made from scratch images. So basically, you start off with an empty image, and then y nowadays people like to write their apps in Go, which is, it has no external dependencies and things like that. Java is different, obviously, so you, you need to have the JDK in your image and so on. Um, this affects how fast the app is deployed, right? Because uh, usually apps in Kubernetes are deployed like in two or three seconds. With Java, it takes a bit longer because it needs to download the image. But when it's, once it's cached, it's OK, right? Um, so running an application in Kubernetes is already, y y even by doing nothing, you get a bunch of uh, things for free, right? If your application cra crashes, Kubernetes uh, restarts it automatically, right? Um, but you can help Kubernetes do even more, right? For instance, an out-of-memory error in Java makes, usually makes your application unusable, right? So the best thing to do if your app is running is in Kubernetes is to call system exit on out-of-memory error or simply use this runtime switch and the JVM will kill your application as soon as, soon as it encounters an out-of-memory error. And 
then as soon as the JVM exits, Kubernetes will restart it, right? So really nice. Um, no more persistent out-of-memory errors. Um, there's also one thing called liveness probes. So you can define an external HTTP endpoint which needs to answer true or false whether your app is still running. And as Kubernetes will talk to that uh, external, to that endpoint and ask your app, are you still running? If it is, it's gonna let it, uh, let it run. If it's no longer running, it's gonna kill it and restart it, right? So that's one of the things also. Um, Skip over this. Java caveats, uh, I think I have what, just one minute, right? Four minutes. Four minutes, okay. Then maybe we can go <laughs> here. Uh, so basically, apps made for Kubernetes usually should be unaware of Kubernetes, right? Um, so that means, so w why do you want that? Because then you can move it outside of Kubernetes whenever you want, right? But uh, sometimes it makes sense to, um, to use the features that Kubernetes brings by having the app talk to Kubernetes itself, right, to the master uh, node. And in order to do that, there are a few options. So Fabricate also has a Kubernetes client. Uh, there's an official Java client for Kubernetes. Or you can roll your own solution because the API is really simple. It's really simple to, let's say, get a list of all the other apps running in the system and things like that. So, and it, this is made even simpler by using a proxy sidecar, uh, which is described in my book. I'm not going to go into it. Um, here's a simple example of how you can talk to the Kubernetes uh, server through the Fabricate client. So basically, listing apps is simple as this, right? You just say, client pods. I'm listing applications in my default namespace because there are multiple namespaces. If you have multiple teams using the same cluster, you can split those apps into different namespaces so there are no name clashes between the namespaces, right? So e each team can work as though they are working in their own uh, separate cluster. Java caveats, I'm sure most of you know this if you're using Docker, but let's say a quick word about that. So um, in Kubernetes, you can obviously specify how much CPU or memory each app can take, right? Um, but the thing is that, so how many of you know about this problem in Docker that the Java sees uh, the complete amount of resources available on the system and not the amount you specify for the container. Yes, but you need to use some The thing is that, please. Oh yeah, this one. Okay. So when you run, let's say, free, uh, the free command, which shows the amount of memory on the system, uh, inside a constrained container, um, you're gonna see the complete memory available on the system, right? And Java, by default, takes that amount into account when determining the maximum heap size and things like that, so you end up with the Java wanting to take more than it's been allotted to it, right? And what, when that happens, it's not gonna be an out of memory error, but the JVM is gonna be um killed, so out of memory killed by the system, and uh, it's gonna keep on crashing. Um, there's a few things how you can uh, solve that, obviously. Yeah. I'm guessing most of you know that, but otherwise take a uh, look into it. Uh, and there's also, the same problem is with CPU, right? Because what happens, you run your app in your development machine, which has, I don't know, four cores, eight cores, but then you deploy it on a cloud uh, system, which has 128 cores. The app is gonna start crashing and it's gonna use up much more memory than it did on your local machine and stuff like that. So the problem with that is that Java also takes into account the number of CPUs available to it, and according to that number, it then runs either 
a smaller number of uh, threads or a large, uh, a large number of threads, right? And if it gets the incorrect information from the system, it's not gonna work properly. Um, um, so this is solved in Java 8, 9, but Java 10 is gonna, uh, is gonna fix those problems by default, so you're not gonna be, uh, you, you won't need to take care of it manually. Um, yeah. Uh, I guess I have time for one question, but otherwise, uh, catch me in the next break. Uh, and also, for any book, for any mailing book, you can get it 40% with a 40% discount by using this code. So if you've been wanting to order something, just do it. Uh, but otherwise, that's it. Thank you.